My name is Melissa Millat, and I'm the Water Program Director at Clean Wisconsin. Great. Well, thanks so much for doing this. Uh, we are here today to talk to you a little bit about the work being done on phosphorus in Wisconsin. A lot of cutting edge work going on. A lot of people have heard a little bit about the phosphorus work in Wisconsin, criteria development and then implementation uh, around the state. But what we'd like to talk about today is kind of how, what you have, how you got it, and where you all are going with the phosphorus work. Because um, we think that this could be something really interesting for watershed groups all around the country to learn from, and perhaps at least the, the good stuff you tell us about, uh, try to replicate. So, so can you start off by giving us just a little bit of background on what it is that Wisconsin has put in place, and then we'll talk a little bit about how you got there. Mm -hmm. um, what Wisconsin's put in place is a phosphorus numeric criteria and implementing language for it. So one of the reasons that a lot of people around the country are looking at um, phosphorus and nitrogen is because it's a big problem in our waterways. It causes algae problems, it causes the dead zone in the Gulf, it's very problematic. And one of the reasons that it's taken so long to do this is that nutrients are really different than other types of pollution. Um, whereas the Clean Water Act has been really effective in controlling toxins that get into our waterways and controlling the things that cause our rivers to catch on fire, it hasn't been effective in addressing nutrient pollution. And the reason that it's been effective in addressing some of those toxins is that most of that pollution comes from point sources. And the Clean Water Act has been really good at limiting what pollutants point sources can put into waterways. But with nutrients, it's different. Most of that pollution comes from non-point sources. It comes from um, farms, it comes from lawns and golf courses. And it's hard to regulate those sources of pollution because it's complicated to figure out where exactly the pollution's coming from, when it's coming. Um, it's hard to monitor that, and it's complicated to control. You can't just put on technology to stop a gully from causing erosion and letting phosphorus into the waterways. So the states have taken decades to figure out how to do this, and we've talked about water quality trading that has its own problems and is complicated, and in 2008 in Wisconsin, the state decided we were really going to try to tackle this issue. Part of that impetus was from nonprofit groups like Clean Wisconsin or Midwest Environmental Advocates, both working with the DNR and talking about um, enforcement to force the DNR to do it. And um, they did, and Wisconsin moved forward. So it was a multi, multi front effort right. to get the DNR to move forward. And over the course of two years, we met with uh, the stakeholder committee that the DNR put together to come up with a rule, and some of us started talking about how complicated this problem was. We talked with um, municipal sewage districts, so wastewater treatment plants and paper mills and other point sources, municipalities, and talked about how unfair it would be to put a phosphorus rule in place that would be expensive to do and wouldn't really address the problem because agriculture would still be causing pollution. Um, and the point sources kept talking about how this, they would put a lot of money into the technology upgrades to control phosphorus, right. but it wouldn't clean up the waterways. And so that would be unfair for rate payers. It would be unfair for companies. It would be unfair for everyone to invest this money and not solve the problem. So some of us broke off on the side for, for two years and talked through this problem over and over and over again. <laughs> and, um, it was a learning experience because it's really frustrating to hear from point sources all the problems with potential regulations, but not necessarily solutions. Mm -hmm. And so um, towards the end of this two-year period, as the DNR was saying, we really need to pass this rule, um, we met very frequently. And some of us environmental groups said, OK, propose a solution. And they did, and it would take 35 years to implement. So? And <laughs> And so some of the environmental groups got together and we just came up with a structure of how the rules should work. And it was a much shorter timeline. It was about a 15 year timeline. And um, what it is, is it's called adaptive management. We didn't come up with that name. Um, the, the point sources original proposal that wasn't gonna work was called adaptive management. Um, but the DNR liked that name and so they used that. But the DNR used the structure that the nonprofits put together and that's the adaptive management, the watershed adaptive management option. 
And what it does is it um, allows the point sources to meet compliance in their permits by cleaning up non-point source pollution so that the waters are so clean that the point source discharge into them um, allows the waters to maintain water quality standards. So some people think of it as trading, right? Um, but it's, it's different than trading because trading is about offsetting your own pollution with some environmental benefits. But watershed adaptive management is about getting the waters to meet water quality standard and ultimately your compliance depends on the waters meeting water quality standards. So it's about the quality in the stream itself or the lake as opposed to at the end of a discharger's pipe. That's exactly. One of the, okay, yeah. that makes sense. And there's a lot of things that are exciting about this. I have just a couple for the people watching this. Um, I'm sure that all of us are really frustrated with some of the politics that are going on in the U.S. and how under attack our government is and how weakened our government is. Yeah. I mean, enforcement isn't happening for on a lot of fronts and government is un, underfunded. So you have these agencies that are totally captured by these industries and they're charged with implementing the Clean Water Act and getting our waters cleaned up, but they can't. I mean, they're not, even when we have Democrats in charge, they're not getting funded and they're, they're not working. So what the phosphorus rule adaptive management option does is it says, it takes that, um, responsibility that's on the DNR, and it also places it on the point sources. And the reason it works is because the point sources have that choice of expensive technology or you know, cleaning up the waters and that being much more affordable mm -hmm. and being a positive thing. Right. And so um, it changes the dyna dynamics of how the Clean Water Act works and takes you know, a small, discrete responsibility. I guess it's not smaller, but it is discrete responsibility on the point sources and broadens it, but it has clear accountability, because it's about water quality standards. That accountability is proper, it's, it's good for our waters, it's good for other, our environment, and it's more cost effective for them. Can you talk a little bit more about the accountability? Because it's always a concern when we talk about trading, is kind mm -hmm. of how you monitor and make sure that this is working, and then what you do in terms of enforcement or accountability measures. So how does that work if, if we're talking about the quality of the stream, there's their monitoring done that is then somehow tied back? How, how will that work? Right. So the way that water quality rules work is that your discharge can't allow the waters that you discharge into to, um, you, you can't cause or contribute to the waters exceeding water quality standards, and that includes where you discharge in downstream. So usually, you know, if you look at that as an equation, there's where the water quality's at, plus your discharge, you know, cannot equal more than the water quality standards. Um, it's kind of changing that equation. Usually you just focus on your discharge and reducing it. But this is focused on the water quality that's in the stream. Right. So what you have to do is um, clean up the non-point sources and clean it up so much that your, the assimilation of your pollution doesn't cause the waters to meet or exceed water quality standards and it doesn't contribute to it there or downstream. Um, the accountability is the water quality in the stream where you discharge and downstream. So point sources have, um, it turns out that they're going to have um, a huge stake in what the water quality is where they discharge. So the numbers that come back from water quality monitoring are going to be critical to them because that's what is, you know, making or break their making or breaking their compliance. Um, and just to put this in perspective, Dane County, uh, Dane County, Madison Metropolitan Sewerage District serves about two hundred fifty thousand people, okay. and for them to put on phosphorus control technology, it would cost about two hundred million dollars over the course of twenty years. That's a very big expense to put for one pollution on this population. And we know that we can clean up the lakes for about 60 million. So for them, you know, it's 200 million and they'd have certain compliance or 60 million and they'd be cleaning up the waters. And there's some of the risks that go into knowing whether or not that right. would work, but it's a, it's a, you know, cost benefit analysis shows that it's worth taking this risk. Right. Um, so at the end of that time period, I guess what the accountability comes down to is, is there, if they're able to make water quality meet water quality standards, 
um, at the end of that time period, then they'll be in compliance with their permit. Okay. 